This is our last class. We have a guest with us, Guy Wallace, who you could see on there. He Guy is, a, is someone I've known for a long time. I'm going to tell you a little bit about him. Uh, he is the acronym King. <laughs> if you want to know what CAD is, it stands for Curriculum Architecture Desi Design. Or he is a design. It, that's true. He is a past president of ISPI. He is a co-founder of the ISPI Charlotte chapter, which is going to be revitalized. And he is the co-founder of HPT Treasures. He also co he also designed and developed and implemented a series of videos called the HPT Practitioner and HPT Legacy series. And now the, what is it, like HPT 2021 and 2022? Yeah, I just, I just changed the title of it. Yeah, so it's, there. there's a, if you ever go to HPT Treasures, you'll see a list of names and some of them you'll recognize. And just, just to throw this out, by the way, he was a vice president at Wachovia for six months, a year. Year three years, half, three years. Was it three years? Wow. And and he but, is. But being a vice president at a bank <laughs> means you're you're you know you could be an entry level employee. I'm sorry, but I was a director. But but yeah, I and all of my staff practically were vice presidents. Yeah, you had a you had a team, and at at one point he had his. Well, you've had a couple of businesses, one with Ray um, uh, Spenson. Ray Spenson. Yeah, with about, you. at one time, you've had, what, like 50 instructional designers working for you in Chicago? Well, we would add subcontractors as needed, but the staff ranged between 15 and 25 over the years. Start, that started in 82, ended in 97, and then I had another company. And that staff ranged from 15 to 25 as well. And I went solo in 2002. Okay. Oh, by the way, Guy has published, if you didn't notice on the links I sent you, several books. The last two, Thought Flow Analysis and Lessons Mapping. The Thought Flow Analysis, if you want to know what that means, you'll either have to ask him or <laughs> buy his book. It's my version of cognitive task analysis because as what the, the research from Dr. Richard E. Clark, who likes to be known as Dick Clark, but Professor Emeritus of uh, Southern California University spent 25 years uh, investigating, researching cognitive, the, the non-conscious nature of knowledge. So 70% of what you, I, you know, all of us, know about our decision-making processes, we can only tell people 30% of that. And 70% of it is non-conscious. It's not available to us. We can make the decisions, but we can't explain what the heck we're doing to anybody. And even when we describe procedurally what we're doing task by task, step by step, we'll miss up to 55% of that. So that has implications for those of us in the uh, instruction, training and development, learning and development profession, because if we're dealing with a subject matter expert, we can pretty much guarantee that what we produce with them will be incomplete. Could be accurate, could be appropriate, but it'll be incomplete. And that's why it's important to do, actually work with more than one subject matter expert, but do reviews and testing of your minimally viable product, because in fact, it might not be so viable. Uh, in terms of providing formal instruction to people. And I've been on a kick on this for quite a while, but, you know, so we, we give people formal instruction. It's partial for some reason, either it doesn't teach people how to apply what we're telling them. It's topic oriented, behavior oriented, but not performance oriented. And that forces them into informal learning, uh, trial and error learning, social learning where they ask somebody and that person it can only give them 30% of what 
what they use to make decisions in 55 and what they actually do. So, so that forces us back again to trial and error learning, which is why the 70 2010 is so heavily weighted to the to the 70 because, and of course, all learning starts as informal learning until somebody decides to start formalizing it to some level. But we are challenged in our profession. Anyway, how's everybody this evening? Very good. Good. Doing well. Doing well. Doing and well. nods are good. Thank you for chiming in. I would tell people, groups that I facilitate, help me out. You can do this for yes, this for no. <laughs> if you're not sure, do a diagonal. I'll catch that. The way this is going to work is I will start, now that I've introduced Guy, I will start by asking him some questions. And when um, I'm actually going to, after uh, receiving an email from Wendy, I'm actually going to ask four questions and try to get things a little bit jump started for you guys. Um, so, and, and I'm hoping you'll get to know Guy through some of these questions, and this will help prompt you with, with your questions. And the way it works is just unmute, raise your virtual hand if you have a question or comment, and and we can get started. And and Guy, I'm going to start with the first question. The first question I want to ask you. You mean these that I saw already? Yeah. 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 The those those particular ones. And and first, I want to comment that if we talk about leadership as being able being is about helping others develop mentally and morally. So my question for you is: when working with instructional design clients, and you've worked with, I saw the list. Of, um, recently, how have you helped them with their own development? Well, I found this to be kind of an interesting question because this, uh, you know, you ask about it mentally and morally and morally and ethics and attitudes and things like that. You know, one of the things that I was actually consciously taught by my first boss out of college in a training and development organization was that we should mess with people's attitudes and such. And so when, when I saw that question, I was, I was thinking about that, that, that I've had to fire clients in the past when their behavior was uh, inconsistent with my values, when I didn't like what they were doing inside their company. I didn't like how they sometimes treated my own staff. And so I've had to fire you know, a Fortune 20 company back in the early 90s. Um, and so I don't know, I think if I'm going to address people's morals or ethics is that I, you know, it's by example, by the way I am, um, by the way I treat my staff, by the way I treat my clients and their staff. Um, but let me move on to the, to the uh, mental uh, part of this, or most of my clients, uh, 45 plus uh, Fortune 500 companies, 80 some, 84 clients in total. Some I can't even name because contractually I wasn't supposed to ever do that. And I've quite frankly forgotten who they were, but they were big companies. Um, and most of my clients have never had experienced performance oriented, performance based instruction. And and so I kind of go into situations expecting that, you know, they are used to an education model where, you know, training and learning is all about topics or behaviors without an application, without a, a situational reality or, or authenticity. And so I've had to kind of uh, demonstrate to them um, what that's all about. I had to talk, I had to think out loud. I had to, uh, you know, I'd be learning out loud, wondering out loud, worrying out loud, um, so that they would kind of understand what I'm thinking about and why I'm doing what I'm doing. I'm, I'm prefacing my questions to them. I'm summarizing, I'm testing understanding because the approach is different when you're focused on people's performance and their outputs. And that makes soft skills hard. You know, when you're talking about communication, communication, what context? What are people saying? What are they doing? What are they trying to produce? What's the ends that communications is a means to or problem solving is a means to? 
And because I know they're not used to that, I need to, that to resonate with them and to make sense to them because how we go about it is different than what they're used to. You know, we can't talk to one subject matter expert. I like to call them master performers and other subject matter experts, people who know a lot about certain things or aspects of the job or performance. But I usually want to deal with master performers who are doing the job to a level of mastery. And then I want to tap into what they know, knowing full well about this non-conscious nature of knowledge and try to extract from them and others that I'm working with um, and get the content right. And, you know, one of the things I would do to help my clients understand this is that in my first meeting, I would try to get my clients to assemble a project steering team of the stakeholders, the people who have something at stake. It's usually, you know, the vice presidents or director levels of the target audience. And if we get their people to perform better, faster, cheaper, they win. You know, that's good for them. And so I've got to talk out loud and explain things um, to them. I've got to be careful of how I don't insult them, but I'm pretty sure that they have not experienced this. And it can make sense to them if I explain it right, because I'm focused on, you know, people, to me, people are on the payroll to produce outputs, which are inputs downstream, to others internally or externally, but they're, per, but they're performing tasks using their knowledge and skills to produce something. And again, that's an input elsewhere. So there's a bunch of stakeholders and I wanna uh, understand them. You know, there's the customer downstream, but then there may be regulators or the law department or HR or other people who are concerned about how we go about and do what we do. Um, and trying to elicit, you know, what are all the requirements about this performance? They produce an output, okay. So how do you know a good one from a bad one? And you know, when you're when you're producing it, what are the things that you need to be compliant with? Internal policies and procedures, external laws and regulations and codes, or whatever. Um, what skills do you really need to do that? But I would warn my clients in my first meeting that I was worried about transfer. We're going to create this thing. Will it transfer? Will it go out to the job? Will the supervisors out there snuff it out? You know, will will that happen? And they're, they're usually shocked to hear that. Um, but I would, would talk about those kinds of things. And I would tell them that, you know, if, if I do my standard approach here, 60 to 70% of the time is going to be spent in practice with feedback. So we're going to keep the amount of information down and give a little demonstration and then get people right into practice with feedback. Round one, round two, round three round four. And I would say, you know, the first one's easy peasy, get everybody, you know, kind of dip their toe into the water. Uh, the second one will be difficult. The third round of practice with feedback will be darn difficult. And the fourth one will be from Hades or from hell. And <laughs> because that's got to be the, you know, the worst that the job context, the performance context you know, that these learners will face because we're trying to prepare them to go back and be good performers and, and competent performers. And so therefore, you know, we have to prepare them to some level. That that allows a dialogue to happen because I want to know more about that. Either they like this, you know, from Hades thing. But that sounds interesting. And we're going to ease them into that. So we're not going to throw anybody in the deep water uh, to start with, but we're going to prepare them and develop their competence and confidence as we take them into more difficult performance situations. Now that's not true for everything. And if it's, you know, they've got easy parts of the job, easy tasks and outputs and all that stuff, I'll say, we'll mention that in kind of in passing, but then we're gonna go on to the hard stuff because that's what we really need to prepare people for. I have a bias against, you know, just because we're skilled at uncovering a, a, a valid learning need doesn't warrant meeting that you know, because maybe we should leave it to informal learning. Uh, maybe we should increase its formality just a little bit, uh, but it's really the high risk, high reward, the high stakes performance that we should focus our attention on and prepare people for that. The easy peasy step of everybody's job, we can just tell them, give them a handout with what used to call it job aids, or performance support or performance guides, whatever we want to call those kinds of things, we can hand that out to people. Um, but we really need to focus on the things that are hardest for people to learn. 
And usually you get that from the analysis. So I talk about those kinds of things and help my clients develop, have a better understanding of what I'm doing for them. It's their project, not mine. Um, and they win or lose if I do a good job or not. And of course, their people win or lose whether or not I give them good instruction or training or learn. Sorry, that was a long answer. Yeah, and I, I think- I prepared a, a long answer, but I just went long anyway. I think it would be, I think you would agree that just when you work with clients and even with the, the subject matter experts, that you actually demystify some of the myths about training and what training is and what it isn't. And, and um, I, I think like HR, they may have a simplified view that anyone could do it. You just, you, you get the most, the, the best expert in the world and, and that's all you have to do. But I think, I think from my experience of working with you is that you, you do a great job of demystifying and educating your clients and subject matter experts. I've been lucky in my, in my, over the course of my career, I've been influenced by a lot of people that could cite the research. I can't, but I know kind of what it says and I can explain it and I have to explain it in layman's terms because I didn't learn it any other way. So talking about the non-conscious nature of knowledge or the importance of practice, you know, that one, practicing something one time, one and done isn't sufficient. Um, and, you know, I've had uh, the, Neil Rackham, who's famous for spin selling, back in the back in 1981, I was an employee at Motorola, and he could see that my clients that he was talking to, it, he was it wasn't resonating with them. What his message wasn't. He was a British chap with a goatee, tweed suit, three piece tweed suit, and he was talking to manufacturing managers, and 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 so he, at one point he just stopped and he said, "Do you guys ever you guys play golf or tennis?" And they all did. And he said, you ever take a lesson? And they all had. And he said, did they ever change your grip? Now, this was beautiful. I was sit, sat there listening, watching this, going, oh, this isn't working so well. Oh, now he's got them hooked. You ever take a lesson? Did they ever change your grip? Of course they force you to change your grip. Everybody's got a bad grip. And uh, and he said, uh, so what happened to your ball control? And they were going, oh, it went all over. It didn't go the right place. And, you know, he said, I bet you reverted back to your old grip. And they all kind of got quiet. And he said, you know, that's the importance of a coach. That's what you do in training. You practice more than once. You get feedback. Guy, you're slipping your grip. You're going back to the old grip. Now get that right grip going. And uh, the coach's job, the facilitator's job, the instructor's job is to maintain the behavior until the results become reinforcing because the immediate results aren't reinforcing. In fact, they will extinguish the new behavior. And so that's important. So I, I, you know, that was demoed to me how he taught my clients this concept of practice and one and done was no good. And, and I think, you know, so I, I saw good models of that. Uh, Neil Rackham and Gary Rumler and, and lots of other people who explained things to their clients that were all, you know, and didn't do it in kind of a pompous way where they were trying to educate or teach the client something. They were just kind of talking about it and why why we wanted to do it a certain way and giving a little bit of explanation without, you know, citing research. Well, speaking of Rumler. In class, we talked about Rumler's fundamental laws of organizations. And guys, what you may not know about Guy Wallace is he has he has worked with Gary Rumler. He has studied with Gary Rumler. He has spent hours and hours and hours with him. So, Guy, you 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 knew him. You you know him, and yeah. you know what he's about. So, yeah. so my first day out of college in my first job in a training organization, I was given a, a, a newsletter from 1970. I started in 1979, but this was a newsletter that was nine years old and it was about guidance, what we would call job aids or performance support nowadays by Gary Rumler and his, and his business partner at Praxis, Tom Gilbert, who's often credited or miscredited with being the father of human performance technology. Um, but yeah, so I got a chance to uh, 
So I was taught Rumler's method. In fact, I was taught a derivative of a derivative of his method because the people I went to work for had been working with Gary Rumler's brother at Blue Cross Blue Shield in Detroit, Michigan. And they taught me all this Rumler, Gilbert, and Harless, and Mager kinds of stuff. And that's how I got schooled in the profession. But then I left that company after a couple of years and went to work at Motorola. And I got the chance to work with Gary Rumler on a dozen or so projects. And he was my consultant, which meant I carried his pencils from client site to client site. Um, and so your, your question is about, you know, the these uh, fundamental laws of organizational systems. And I had to go look that up and print that off um, because it's been a long time since I've, I've looked at any of that stuff. And i I believe it. And so your question was, you know, do, 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 do these apply to all organizations, including school administrations? And certainly it, it's, it's, they are applicable. Um, you know, I was taught at the very beginning to focus on what Gilbert called accomplishments, what Rumler called outputs. And I mentioned that earlier, people are on the payroll to produce outputs that become inputs downstream. And one of the things that Gary Rumler and Dale Brethauer, the late Dale Brethauer, modeled was this process, you know, typical process flow, inputs, process, outputs. And then there was a thing called the receiving system of those outputs. And they sit in judgment about that output because it's their input. And there's other stakeholders in the performance context, as I kind of talked about a little bit earlier. But so all of these things apply to every organization. If you begin to think of, you know, everybody's in the business of producing outputs and, you know, they either know what the requirements are or not. And we're trying to help them learn how to do that better. And um, my when I went to work at Motorola, Gary Rumler was coming in to do a one-day workshop with the new staff at Motorola. And I came in a week earlier before my official start date to attend this thing. And there's a video of, uh, of an hour of, of it out of the whole day. But it was, you know, we looking at the processes, managers need to approach, you know, um, uh, use approach their work using Rumler's kind of thinking, you know, thinking about process and outputs and understanding all of that. So, yeah, you need to understand what are the outputs, what are the tasks, what are people got to know to be able to do, and what is, where's this output going? Are there tasks that are unnecessary? The whole lean uh, out of the quality movement, the whole lean effort is reducing unnecessary tasks, getting rid of them, streamlining things, as it was called back in the day. And a lot of Rummer's work back in the 80s was lean. And when Motorola um, created Six Sigma back in the mid 80s, they licensed Gary Rummer's intellectual property to create that because they embraced the Rummer process orientation. You know, the swim lane flow charts that you see where there's swim lanes going across, yeah, he, he didn't invent that, but he popularized that. And the customer was always at the top, so you could see what are you doing to the customer? You know, how many times do they have to interact with them? Are they doing the same thing over and over again? Are you driving them crazy? So there's a lot of, lot of truth in these laws. Understand the performance requirements. Organizational systems adapt or die because things change. Your competition changes the th things or you change them on the competition. Um, when one component of an organization's system optimizes, an organization often sub-optimizes. There's a great story from NSPI back in the mid 80s of, of a, somebody came in and they presented this. They were part of a sales training organization and they developed a new sales process with their customer and they trained everybody and they implemented this process and it doubled the cycle time. Now, if you're a math student, you can say you double the cycle time. That means you're having the revenues. They have the revenues of this corporation. You know, and if you're doing a million dollars a month, you're now doing a half a million dollars a month. But they are following the process to the T. And so they optimize the sales process 
but they suboptimized the organization. So of course, as soon as they discovered that they reverted back to the old way of doing things. So systems thinkers, you know, would have thought about that as they were implementing this new process. What does this do to cycle time? What does that do to the output? That output called revenues, you know, oh, it has them. That's not good. Um, and so the fourth point here was, you know, pulling any lever in the system, you'll have an effect on other parts of the system. You train somebody, you can improve the system. Um, you can, if you're not careful, you'll sub-optimize other parts of the system. You might take a, find a way to streamline something, take a shortcut that looks fine from your vantage point. But, but elsewhere, I remember at Motorola, they used to talk about line of sight. Somebody that's working on a factory line, they've got a certain line of sight. They can look upstream and downstream, and that's what they know. And in the next building, some, they, they're pro, they could be doing something that's causing a problem 27 steps in the process later. Doesn't show up till then. And so everything looks fine until then. And 27 steps downstream, people are going, what, you know, how do we fix this? You know, I can't see myself why we're having this problem. And it's because it's being caused outside everybody's line of sight. So systems thinkers have to really think broad about the entire process. You know, processes are all interconnected. Um, and we need to understand that chain of processes uh, and really, and really, kind of think uh, about that before we start implementing solutions. We really need to understand, you know, what are we trying to do? Is it problem oriented? Is it opportunity oriented? How do we make this improvement? What are the consequences of us making this change? Not immediately in the process that we're op working on, but most likely downstream. We're not going to affect things upstream. So what's what could this mean downstream? You know, we got to think that through mentally, and we've got to test what we do and see if something bad shows up downstream later on. And that's you know, a lot of organizations don't have the patience or time to to do that. They're you know, just just do it is kind of an attitude that uh, often leads to disaster. Again, a long answer to all of that, but yeah, the whole Rumler kind of thing, all the systems thinking things. I remember him talking about who taught him systems thinking, and it was his good buddy from college, uh, Dale Brethauer, another luminary at uh, NSPI, ISPI. Um, but yeah, so I think that those, the whole approach, and he, he's not alone in this. There's lots of other people with other models. The whole world of total quality management has a lot of similar kinds of models. They come at things as engineers might looking at, you know, things. And we kind of come at, at this looking at people. And we, they need to, you know, they need to have a better handle on the people part of processes. And those of us who come at uh, instruction and training and learning, we need to have a more, uh, a more in-depth view of all the components of process performance that people perform in because there's other things in their environment, the data, the tools, the machines, the, the facilities that they work in, the consequence system. One of the things I learned from Rumler is that, you know, if somebody comes to you with a problem, uh, don't start thinking about fixing the people. First of all, look at the process. One, is there one? Two, if there is, is it being adhered to? And if not, why not? And he would say that the second thing he would look at would be the consequence system. Are we punishing people for good behavior and rewarding bad behavior? Do we give Gary more work than Guy because Gary is doing a fabulous job and he can get the job done and Guy we're not too sure about. So yeah, we got new work, let's give it to Gary. You know, We inadvertently punish people that way and Gary wises up pretty quickly and he starts slacking off and now his performance has deteriorated and we all wonder why, you know, why did that happen? Yeah, my fault. <laughs> that, that's how it goes. Well, I got the next question, maybe a little redundant and you've already, might've already answered that. And that is what advice do you give instructional designers and how to influence 
their sponsors and subject matter experts to try to think more systemically about problems? So I don't think that you can directly influence them and then say, hey, wake up and start thinking systematically, systemically. Uh, and, and I think you need to demonstrate that. So my note was here, demonstrate it uh, yourself and think out loud, talk out loud about it, work out loud about it. Oh, I'm thinking about this and I'm thinking about that. And I wonder if this will have an impact of that, you know, um, when we think quietly to ourselves, we're not sharing and we that's we're reducing the opportunity for them to say, oh, I know the answer to that one. And they can contribute and begin to broaden their perspective. So when Guy starts a project, when we're reviewing the project plan and we haven't done analysis, we haven't done design, we haven't done development, and I'm worried about transfer after development and I'm trying to have my clients think about that transfer issue. You know, are we giving them too much? Are we expecting people to memorize way too much and they're not going to be able to do it? And, you know, so it will not transfer because they'll have forgotten it before they get back to the job. So I think you can demonstrate that your, your system's thinking and like a rumbler and like a lot of other people that I've had the opportunity to work with, you know, Back in the old days, we'd go to people's flip charts and draw things out for them. And now we go to people's whiteboards and do that, or we can go on to the online tools that we have and do some of that and, and demonstrate our systems thinking to get them thinking about that and inviting them in to share what they know about that broader system and the various aspects of that. And, you know, if, push, if we push this here, what will happen elsewhere? Do they know um, and engage them in that? As a consultant coming in to organizations, you know, I can I can ask the stupid questions because how would I know? I don't work there. I don't do this job. So I can ask the kind of dumb questions to help elicit answers. Even, you know, like a good lawyer, you know, you ask questions that you think you know the answer to. No, I, I ask questions that I know I need the answer to, but I don't know. And I don't want to speculate and guess. I want to get confirmation even if I have it, I've told, I tell clients, I'm not afraid to be wrong. So if you catch me being wrong, don't give yourself a pat on the back. You don't get any, any brownie. But, um, so, but I'm going to ask questions here and get answers out. And part of it is I need a dialogue. If somebody says something, I want the other side of the room to chime in and either confirm what they say or deny it or ask questions yourselves to clarify what do they mean by that? Um, and if we're all working to build instruction, build learning that's going to improve people's performance, and these people have a stake in that, you know, I can usually get their kind of cooperation doing that. In right now, um, in the chat, Levi, you posted a a question for Guy. Uh, could you articulate? I, I I see that you just took a mouth of food. <laughs> I'm asking you to, to talk about it, but if, if you would just kind of explain what you're interested in. Sure. Guy, you know, thank you for having this talk with us and looking at your, your historic uh, function across many companies. I'm curious, uh, you, you've obviously worked with many talent development, training development directors, uh, HPT practitioners. I was just curious, a lot of us in this, this class have, backgrounds in education, uh, maybe looking to make that jump. Uh, just curious what you think is a key, you know, personality type or a key personal skill that you've come across time and again in those that, uh, that are high performers. Um, well, I don't think it's a personality type because I think whatever your personality is, whether you're an extrovert or an introvert, you can be successful. I'm an introvert, believe it or not. Um, but, you know, here I am on stage and I got to, you know, do this, you know, but otherwise I wouldn't, I'm, I'm not like this all the time. But um, I think that the successful people that I've seen have this performance orientation and I, I am on this big kick, you know, this later this month, I turned 70 years old and I'm kind of, a, I'm semi-retired and I've 
was challenged by Gary Rumler back in 99. Because I happened to be visiting him in his office and and I he was reviewing my first book that I wrote solo and uh, lean ISD. And I was and I had called him up and said, hey, I'm crediting you for my approach to analysis. I learned a derivative of a derivative of your approach to analysis back 20 years earlier. And uh, and if you don't like what I've written, I'll take that out that I'm crediting you because I don't want to embarrass you. And he said, well, come on down to Tucson and spend some time with me. So I flew from Chicago and I was sitting in his office and he was writing in a whiteboard. And I said, how am I ever going to repay you for everything you've done with for me? And he's he stopped writing. He looked at me, he said, you can't. And then he went back to writing. And he said, you're going to have to do what. I've been doing because I could never repay my mentors either. I had to pay it forward. And so the professional society I grew up in was very open about sharing. And here is this man who's given me so much of his time sharing and and training me, uh, developing me. And he was all about performance. So I'm on this big kick of the um, helping people to get performance oriented. You know, for too long, for this was true when I first started in 1979, people were focused on topics and behaviors. In fact, Tom Gilbert wrote about the cult of behaviors because people are all about behaviors as if they're all, they're not situational. You know, good cop, bad cop, you know, which one it should be this time. Um, and, and the focus on those outputs and what Gilbert called accomplishments, which is basically outputs. And to have that orientation and know that's what we're trying to affect. That's what we need to measure. That's what we need to uncover in analysis. And later on, when we're done, we're doing evaluation. That's what we need to be focusing on. There's no mystery. Are they producing those outputs better, faster, cheaper? Are the downstream customer and the customer's customer and that customer's customer, customer, are they okay with what we're producing way up upstream here? And so I think that the people that, were ultimately very successful, were focused on performance. And they saw learning and and as a means to the ends of performance, not learning as an ends to itself. Now, I've said, you know, Bob Baker had this great thing about the difference between training and education, because training was the language we used to use back in the old days. So this was in the 80s. And, And there's always been this controversy about you know, the educational approach to things and the training approach to things. And is it different or is it the same or is it what? And Bob Mager was at the speaking to the entire conference at, at an NSPI conference in the mid 80s. And he said, you already know the difference between education and training. And he said, imagine you send your kid off to college and they write home because this was the 80s. So we wrote home. They were taking a sex education course. You know, you're going, oh, okay. Or they wrote home and said, I'm taking a sex training course. See, he said to the audience, you already know the difference. And so so many people in the educational world that are moving into training or what we now call learning and development, they need to have that orientation to it's more like sex training than sex education. It's really, you know, doing it. It's getting down to the performance. And, And so I think that the people that kind of, escape their own view of what training is because we all have an education model because we all came through the educational system. And and in education, you don't know most of the time, most always, you don't know what people's terminal performance requirements are in their jobs. You're going to teach them about spreadsheets or you're going to teach them about this or that, but you don't know what their specific application is. But in corporate training or corporate learning or enterprise learning, we pretty much know most, almost all the time what that is, or we could find out, but we don't have the processes and the practices in place, and we've not developed our people to do uh, adequate analysis effort that will feed design, that will feed development, that we can then transfer to the job and see, are we getting people to produce outputs better, faster, and cheaper? And the people who began to think like that, more of a, I've told people that, yeah, my own training, my own company, I got, you know, 15 to 25 people. I want to operate it like it's an engineering department, not like an artist colony. I don't want everybody doing their own thing, their own way, because it's totally out of control. 
And I had a client challenge me back in the 80s when I had two other business partners and one of our people had done a project for them and then somebody else had gone in and done a project for them and it didn't add up. They did it totally different. The analysis data was totally different. The design was totally different. What was developed was totally different. And my work, on the other hand, was more, you know, controlled in that I do analysis a certain way. I generate analysis data in certain configuration. In fact, I, in 94, I, I, I set some staff members to develop a database because all I wanted the analysis data to go into there, trying to force the hands of my two business partners and some of my staff. When you do analysis, it's got to fill in this, this, this template here because it's going to go into a database. And then we're going to uh, create things that go into design from that. And I was trying to standardize on all of those things. I wanted it to be as rigorous as required and as flexible as feasible. But I didn't want everybody going and doing their own thing because one of the things that I've tried to do in the, my design methodologies is to reuse clients' content. They've already had shareholder equity converted from cash to content. And can I reuse it as is or after modification? But why should I reinvent wheels if they've already paid for wheels and they've got an inventory of wheels in their inventory of content? And so if I design content a certain way, I'm going to increase the probability that people will be able to use it for other target audiences as is or with a slight modification. You know, everybody needs active listening skills. The application of active listening skills differs. If you're a financial auditor, it's kind of similar to an analyst in, in L&D. Or if you're an engineer talking with a customer trying to establish the requirements, it's a little bit similar. If you're a salesperson, it's a little, kind of similar, but they're different. And if you're doing instruction for people, giving them generic active listening training forces them from formal learning into informal trial and error because you didn't teach me how to apply it in my context with the easy peasy, the difficult, the darn difficult from Hades kinds of situations. Um, and that's what I need to be prepared for. So my concept was take the active listening, bookend it on the front end with, you know, guy, here's what you're going to do with it. Here's the job. Here's what's tricky about this. Here's what you're going to go learn. Go learn it. Go learn the generic stuff. Now come back and practice with feedback that's authentic to you. You're not a salesperson, so these aren't going to be sales role plays you're going to be in. You're an instructional analyst, and you're going to be interviewing people, and you're going to be using your active listening skills in those kind of situations. And when you meet with clients, you're going to be using active listening. And so let's practice things that are will feel real if you don't already know that they're real because you're new, just off the boat, fell off the turnip truck. Um, you know, so you wouldn't know. But if you're an experienced performer and you're learning how to apply active listening, we you'll know what's authentic and real enough so that you're really preparing yourself to do the job. Um, and and so I think that that's, you know, the, the this performance orientation, latching onto this scene that, and as a leader, Putting in the processes and the practices, which are the variations in your process, you know, how do I situationally adapt to this situation without totally throwing my process away? And then preparing the people for doing that. You know, you can buy software tools and things like that, but it's the interpersonal skills, the communication skills, what we all used to call the soft skills that, you know, can make or break people. And, and but when we teach people that, prepare them for that, we need to prepare them using those things in something that's authentic so that that when they get out back to the job, it feels just like the practice session that they had in training. Um, and I, so I think that that's really key. It's the people who latch, don't let go of an educational model, who don't see that need to get much more authentic. I think that those are the people, that's why there's a revolving door at all levels of L&D, at the very top, the leadership and the new people coming in and everybody in the middle here, because it can be frustrating when you don't have a, a good impact and it's not your fault. You know, I like to say that, you know, I would never blame a practitioner for, you know, not producing performance-based instruction. It's really their leadership 
And, and whose fault is it that the L&D leadership is deficient and not doing this right? It's this enterprise leadership. They're not holding them accountable for producing, but they but they have the education mindset too. They're thinking that, oh yeah, you waltz in and you, you tell them some stuff and you give them a quiz to see if they remember what you told them or you give them a test this, today or next week or next month. And it's all about knowledge and regurgitation of knowledge rather than application of knowledge that's authentic. And so some people, you know, have a kind of an engineering mindset, technical people find that easier to uh, understand and grasp and then maybe apply. Um, others, you know, may not see that as readily and, and may be stuck with that education model. Sorry, that's a very long answer. Those are all I have is long answers. I checked the box earlier today and the short answers were all gone. There, there you go. Well, let's open it up. We got a quarter of the time, about a quarter of the time left. Um, and if you would, it, what questions ask, what questions you have from your perspective and, and what could help you? This is a great opportunity to consult. And I, Wendy, you're up. Yeah. Um, first of all, I appreciated your um kind of putting learning in different categories, right? So the, especially how you mentioned uh, topic learning and versus basically object behavior, well, behavior was one of the topic versus task learning. And I think um, that's in the teacher world, that's the difference between explain and do, right? And I think a lot of times in my very, I'm a former classroom teacher of middle grades and I'm just a, a brand new ID. But the SMEs that we've been working with really want to just explain something to someone and not be focused on the performance, just kind of like what you're talking about. And really, they have a hard time even with their objectives. So it's almost like they just want to give a general knowledge overview of something which yeah. is, does not um, mean training, right? So that's a different type of learning. Well, but, well, that is it because they they want to give you. They're not sure, so they're going to give you everything that they know. It's not prescriptive. It yes, yeah. so I, I certainly see that. And then in um, the video that I watched that uh, Dr. DePaul had, you had a quote though. You, you said that the SME they are resistant to the to the A part. Our our thing is trainers and our educators, and this is the Addy model, right? And they don't want to analyze. They want to just skip to, they want to tell you what to do. And you said, but the balance of that, you said, you don't have to boil the ocean for a cup of tea. So I think somehow, and if you'll tell me about that balance, because the, the client wants you to make this training, not spend your 90 days analyzing to come up with the same, they think training. So how do you find that balance to get them to help you be able to analyze and yet not take it too long where they're not interested, I guess, is my question. Yeah, so part of the, our whole challenge is the cycle times for doing things and the whole notion of boiling the ocean for a cup of tea that came out of the quality movement. You know, we can get into analysis paralysis because we just take too darn long. Mm -hmm. And that's because we don't know what we're going to get. And so that my comment earlier about, you know, I know what analysis data I want. I can put it into a database. If the field is empty, that means I didn't get it. Um, so I want to know what the output is, what the measures are, how you know a good out from a bad one, and then what are the tasks performed and then some other data. But what I discovered when I trained people on doing my approach to analysis, um, I found that a lot of people can't think about outputs. They can think about tasks and what they do. And so if a client came to me and wanted me to develop some instruction on this topic or on this behavior, um, I would, you know, do my best active listening, take it in, understand it, repeat it, regurgitate back to them, summarize what they've said so they know that I heard them. And then I would ask them, so what would practice look like? What's, how would people apply this topic or this behavior? Tell me about that. And and sometimes they'll, they'll talk me through that. And it's like saying, oh, well, we'll create an interview guide and then we'll interview people and then we'll do this and then we'll do that. And then we'll generate an analysis report. And I go, oh, is that analysis report and output? Oh, good. Okay. So we're going to have people practicing producing analysis reports or 
or producing interview data because we're going to create an interview guide and then we're going to conduct interviews and then we're going to produce a bunch of data from interviews and we're going to summarize those things. So the, the output, see, there's usually a bunch of interim outputs as well as terminal outputs. But so if you've established the output, so when I do design, you know, I, I gather analysis data in advance and then do the design or I do them simultaneously depending on the scope of the project. Mine are usually fairly big projects, so I'd separate those two. But if you can go in there and ask people, you know, what is the job about? What's the performance? What's the output? What's the practice look like? Let's not talk about all the content. Let's talk about what practice. How will we know that they we, we taught them the right stuff before we figure out what that list of stuff is? What's the practice look like? And try to focus in on that and then find, then the information so I have this information, demonstration, application. When I do uh, design a lesson map, as Gary was talking about one of my books earlier. Uh, so that's my, that's my, those are my components, uh, instructional activities, information, demonstration, application, info, demo, appo. And so what's the appo? What's the application exercise? What's that practice with feedback? You think they'll need it more than once? Yes or no is their answer. And I don't really care. I just give them thinking, get their wheels thinking, spinning, and because I know I'm going to do more than one um, if it's really critical performance. And then talk about a demonstration. So what would we show them before we had them practice it? Because, you know, that makes it fair and easier. They'll be, they won't struggle starting it off. If we actually show them what we want them to do and then have them start doing it once or twice or three times or four times. And then what information is there? And so I have these categories of knowledge and skill. You know, are there laws and regulations they need to comply with when they're doing that performance in the real world? Are there internal policies and procedures? What tools and equipment do they use? What, what other organizations might they have to interface with? Um, what interpersonal skills might they need? And on and on and on. And so I can, I can systematically elicit the enabling knowledge and skills once I understand the performance, once I've documented and of course, I like to write things down on flip chart easels or whiteboards or something so that we can all look at that and go, yeah, that's the performance. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. In between tasks three and four, I think there's another task we were missing. See, it's that non-conscious nature of knowledge. So I'm trying to put things in front of people so that they can look at that and go, something's missing, damn it. And I don't know what it is, but give me a moment. Of course, they're not paying attention to what I'm facilitating when I'm doing that. But so to help a subject matter expert rather than allow them to do the dump, I like to get them to focus on that terminal output, the tasks that are performed, and then what you gotta know. And I try to elicit that rather than them dumping or telling me everything or giving me their slide deck or whatever, I wanna ask that and pull that, tease that out. And then I'm in a position to potentially challenge them about, well, why do they need to know that? I don't see how that, help me out here. Guy is stupid, you know. Uh, I didn't have my coffee this morning. And so why do they need to know that piece of information? How does that fit this demonstration and this application, these tasks and outputs? You know, and sometimes it's just, oh, well, that comes up every once in a while. So that's just good to know. Oh, okay. So maybe we'd save that for later and not, you know, when we, when we introduce this to people and get them to start thinking about segregating, sorting all, everything that they know into something that's logical. They're afraid that they're going to be held accountable for this, your content being incomplete because they didn't give it to you. So they tend to dump everything out. So knowing that they have that need, we need to have, you know, receptacles ready for all of their piece part knowledge to show them how it might be used, where it might be used, when it might be used. Is this for that easy peasy exercise stream? Or maybe this is the one from Hades. So that thing that they need to know for that happens every three blue moons, we're going to save that to that for Hades. And we're going to toss that in there. And we're going to tell them about it, teach them about that, demonstrate it to them, have them practice contending with that too. So I, this is a struggle working with subject matter experts. And I, I did, you know, so if I know that there we're got a situation where we're dealing with the non-conscious nature of knowledge and they can't tell me everything, but they can tell me a lot. 
And I just got to figure out how it's going to be used, where it fits into the instructional flow in that first tier, the easy peasy, the, the difficult, the darn difficult, the from Hades, where is that going to go in the mix? And so I draw charts out and things like that and explain things to people. And then when I they're giving me something, I can write it down and tag it with where it's going to go in that eventual flow. Um, and and then the, so uh, but i prefer working with a group of master performers uh, or subject matter experts and eliciting that but you've got to find ways to do this quickly because and you and i think the the secret to being quicker about it is knowing not the data that you want but the type of data i want the output i want the measures how do you know a good one from a bad one you know is it quality quantity cost Time, schedule, safety, those are the measures of things. Are any of those applicable here? And having those mental models, frameworks that you can use to elicit the data and pull it from them, interview them and pull it out there rather than expecting them to do the big dump. And so um, when I can show them, you know, I've got a chart here and I'm going to be taking notes. So here's my questions and I can walk them through this. That stops them from doing the you know, the gush of giving me everything that they, you know, know, and me trying to figure it out, I can't intake it that way. So I can stop them and say, let me ask you these questions. And we'll get to that. And making sure that they have plenty of time, that I don't go too fast. I say, so is there anything that we're missing now? And if they come up with something, showing them where it might fit in that instructional flow and having them part of the decision about whether that is easy peasy or from Hades or something in the middle and getting them thinking about how I would go about and do a design before we get into development. And, and while we're gathering that stuff at some point saying, so you probably have a lot of materials that relates to what I, what I've captured here and I can use that as source materials. And who else would we talk to to double check our work to make sure that you know we're not missing anything? You know, they know generally they know other people. But the trick is to make it go fast, and and that's what's hard. If we go and do a bunch of interviews and we're not sure what we're looking for, I've seen I I because I was taught this approach back in 1979 from the very beginning. When I'd go to conferences and local chapter meetings and I'd see other people's task analysis and they were like random tasks, you could have put them in there alphabetically and they would have made as much sense as when I'm looking at them going, I can't figure out, you know, I can imagine some executive looking at task analysis and going, well, yeah, 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 they do that too. Yeah, they do that too. Uh, you're asking me to sign off on this thing. Well, I don't get it, but okay. You know, because tasks like topics or behaviors, sans, without, outputs are meaningless. They're just things. And if we don't understand that those are means to an end, what's the end? And the output, I think, is the secret thing to focus on. Well, there you go. On that note, it's eight o'clock. Don't have time for more questions, but guys. Uh, if, if somebody's got something like, uh, I'm 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 happy to stay. The rest of you can bail, and I'll just chat with Gary. Oh, there you go. So if any, so if you like to leave now, now's a good time to to bail. Um, if you want to view the recording later, you can. If you have questions, and this is like I said, this is a great time to take advantage of Guy being willing to continue to talk to get some advice or insight um into what you do so i'm just i'm just gonna sit back and and let you guys either drop off or ask more questions and we got people dropping off that which is all right it's time So those left, uh, feel free to open your mic and ask and talk to Guy. No, don't and don't feel bad if you need to go. That's okay.
I already asked a question, so I'm waiting for Jonathan. <laughs> well, <laughs> and Levi and I, along with Ashton, have a group where we're meeting to start our group project right after this. I can't stay too long because I don't want to hold, oh. hold them up. Um, this is like, how did you get your first clients? I've been wanting, I meant to like ask that to everyone we've talked to over the course of the semester. And this is actually the first time that those words have tumbled out of my mouth, but it seems like what is a pretty straightforward question, right? But like, if you, if we ever wanted to get into, you know, consulting work, how do you, how do you, where do you start? This is the most difficult thing for people. I think that get into our business is the um, cold calling, marketing, uh, selling, um, most of us, uh, I'm overgeneralizing here, but most people are, are introverts. They are, they, they don't want to push. They don't want to sell. They would rather market than sell. They'd rather tell you all about the stuff they can do. And then you should, you know, the customer should. That's right. Yeah. Cold calling sounds. It, it, it is. And, uh, but the, so I left Motorola and I joined a small consulting firm and the, the guy that founded the firm, He'd been in business for a number of years. He used to get on, he used to, this was back in the days of the Rolodex, but he came out there and spin through his Rolodex and make phone calls and talk to people that he knew and said, hey, we're looking for some work. You got anything for us? And, you know, th that was after a little chit chat and then there'd be followed by a little chit chat, but basically he would be so bold as to ask, you know, this is what we do. And they most likely knew that. The other, so so he generated a lot of our business from prior customers or just his network, people that he had met because he was members of a professional organization and, you know, he got to meet them there. And the other thing is that we just did, we wrote articles and we presented at conferences and local chapter meetings. And my first day after, after I left Motorola in Chicago, uh, I, we flew to Houston my first day on the job at this consulting firm, and we were going to work for Exxon, and I was going to spend three days there. And that first night, we went to the NSPI, which is what ISPI used to be. We went to the Houston chapter, and we presented there on the thing I was talking to you about today, about outputs and <laughs> measures and tasks and you know performance modeling and or job modeling, as some others called it. But that's what, what we were talking about. And... Uh, and people came up afterwards and talked to us. And um, so I, I, I did three projects with the guy that came up to talk with us afterwards. And Gary, it was, it was Ken Summers. And I did work for him. And this was in 82. And I did work for him in 83 and 86 and 2013 and 14. Wow. And the fourth project then in 2015. And um, so I think that part of this is, you know, as a consultant, you've got to decide uh, what you can share and what you're willing to talk with. And my business partner, the late Ray Spenson, used to say, you know, we, we got complaints because we would write books and people would say, you give away too much in your book. And he would say, you know, yeah, okay, so... 20% of the readers can read our book and then they don't need us and they can go do it. 20% don't have a clue as to what they read. And so they're not interested anyway. It's that, you know, 60% in the middle that might someday say, yeah, we can't do that. We don't have the skills or we don't have the time. We're busy with other things and we need somebody to do those things. So when we would do presentations, we would, tell you exactly what it is we produced and how we did it. We would tell you what our output is. Here's an example. Here's the steps, the tasks that we performed to do this. And we would demystify it. And people would either see the value in that or they wouldn't. And, it, you know, I go to, I've seen a lot of conference presentations and read a lot of articles. And it's a big tease. I just finished reading a draft of a book by somebody and I won't mention who they are or what it's about, but it was one big tease for the thing that they sell. 
And it never gave me enough information for me to make an actual judgment as to the, you know, whether I thought this was worthwhile or not. It was a tease, a bunch of non secretary seek, you know, changes from here to there, all jumping around. And I just felt like, okay, you know, I'm going to turn a page here, so to speak, on the Kindle and I'm going to, you know, get another tease. And then I'm going to, we're going to go off into all sorts of direct. And so I think that, you know, selling is both marketing. Um, you know, under, you know, being clear about your value proposition, what is it that you do, you know, under what situations or conditions would that be uh, useful? What, you know, what's it for? Because a part of it, our, our challenge is our languages, you know, with our clients, depending on who we're talking to, our language is different. We're talking to engineers or salespeople, they use different language. And so we got to try to figure out, you know, what, what, but it all goes down to the need, from my perspective, you know, in, in structural design business, I'm going to help their people learn how to perform better. So I can let, learn their language for what their people do and what they produce and the situation or context that they're in um, and pitch my approach and so the other thing is then I think that's always tough was the how do you price your yourself and your projects. That's yeah. A, yeah. yeah. Not and I would I developed this thing called the uh, let's see the activity block, and so I would say um, I would I've done this so many times with clients going back into the eighties where I would go to their whiteboard or their you know their flip chart years before that and map out. So here's how we do, here's my phases for my project. You know, I do project planning and kickoff, then I do analysis, then I do design. But in each one of those phases, there's an activity with an output that leads to another activity with an output. And I can break, do a work breakdown structure of my approach right there in front of my client's eyes. I can go back and say, Guy is going to spend X amount of time doing this. Gary's going to spend this much of time here. My production support person uh, is going to do spend this much time doing that activity. And then the next one and the next one, I break it all down in terms of the flow, what we're doing. Then I'd go put time estimates on all of that. I'd go add it up and I, you know, then put my daily or hourly rate. I was told back in 82, not to quote myself at an hourly rate because I'd sound like a lawyer and everybody hates lawyers. So I've always <laughs> the daily rate. And, uh, and and so I'd put that on there and I'd multiply it out and I go, okay, that's the time and expense estimate for you. My time, Gary's time, and the production person's time. You all add it up, multiply it out right there in front of your very eyes. No mystery there. And if you want me to do this fixed fee, if I think I can do this for fixed fee, because I think I can figure it out and it's not that crazy, I'm going to add 15 or 20% to those numbers. Boom, and that's your new total. And I'll do it for fixed fee or time and expense, your choice, let me know. I'm flying back to Chicago tonight. You call me up in the morning, tell me which way you want me to price that and I'll send you a proposal. And they go, whoa. And you know, so I just tried to be very open about how it is we do these things. It exudes confidence because I can plan it right, right now in front of you. Um, yeah, there's a bit of showmanship to that that I really like. There is because I'm and I'm thinking out loud, you know, how much time will this be? And I'm thinking out loud so they can figure out how did he come up with those numbers? Because most of them, you know, most managers, my theory is, is that their job, as they see it, is to take your number and cut it in half and take the amount of time that you want and cut it in half and see what you say and think and do and you know, that's just that's just their their mental approach to this is that everybody's sandbagging, and so we're just going to cut it in half and see what they say. So I would think that through, and I'm not going to negotiate whether that's I'm going to run a three day meeting and only take a day and a half to run a three day meeting. You know, that's not I <clears throat> can't do it. So I'm not going to change. So there, I can figure that out. And right now, you know, and I'd say I'm going to take these flip chart pages, or you know, later on I had the cell phone and I could take pictures take that back to my office and turn that into a project plan and they can keep what I produced. You know, I'll leave it here with you. Um, but if it was a flip chart or a whiteboard, of course, I'd, I'd have to find some way to take that back so I could write it all up. But that was it. I could do the planning right there in front of them. I just couldn't give them a pretty, you know, 
pretty document that they could then submit and get reviewed and get approvals for and all of that kind of thing. But that, but so selling is hard, but then it's, it's, you know, how you, part of the sales thing is establishing the price and either, you know, for me to do my work costs me, you know, I got to pay people and all that. And so these are our rates. That's what the price has to be. Now the question is, is it a value to the client? And one of the things I was taught by people in the quality movement um, was too often we lead with what's the price or the cost or what the quality movement would call the cost of conformance. If we're going to fix something, what's that going to cost? Well, the real trick is to establish what's the value of the problem or opportunity first. So I did a project with General Dynamics back in 1990 on uh, a curriculum architecture design on computer aided design, so CAD for CAD, and and the price tag to implement after I after I do the design, uh, my guess is that you'll spend two million dollars building out my design, and and they said two million dollars. Well, that's <laughs> that guy. That's crazy. I was in a room with twenty some people, and. Uh, and I, and I went to the front of the room and I said, okay, you got a hundred people doing this job, right? And they go, yeah, just about. And I go, so what's the fully loaded salary? They said $65,000 a head. And I said, okay, a hundred people times 65. That's how much you're spending for the performance. Now, earlier, in an earlier meeting, you guys said that these people were not proficient and they were probably operating around 25% proficiency from where they could be. You still believe that number? And people are going, oh, it's worse than that. I go, okay, let's just go with 25 then. So you're only getting 25% of the $6.5 million of value. That's how much the delta is here, where if you improve their performance, you will get, because they said, that's just salary dollars. That's not including all the scrap and all the bad tooling that these former drafts people working on a computer-aided design system were doing. So I helped them establish I did it backwards, but I established, I established the price first, and then we established the value of their, their issue, their problem or opportunity. And all of a sudden, the $2 million looked like a pittance. And so they went off and sold it. And my, I'd done the design for, they were able to get the money to build out the training and to implement it and train those 100 people. Uh, and so that was a valuable lesson. I actually wrote an article for one of the ASTD uh, technical and skills journals back in 91, I think it was, on, on that. And that, so I started doing that, working with clients to figure out, well, so what's, what's this worth? Right. Well, I like that embedded in that is you really get to demonstrate that you understand the pain of their problem, right? Yeah. Uh, which is and sometimes they don't know it all that well themselves. Yeah, it seemed like in that example, you just threw, they didn't really realize how bad it was. Exactly. They didn't know what the dollar meant. They just go, oh, it's terrible. We got all these problems here. And they never stepped back and did a systems kind of view of this. And I thought, I, there's no way we can estimate scrap and all that stuff. And we'll get into huge arguments. But let's just go with the fact that you're paying 100 people this amount of money that equals this. And you say they're only 25% proficient. So just in salary dollars alone, if we got them to the 75th percentile of performance, what's that worth in year one? And then in year two and three and four, and this thing pays for itself within the first year. Yeah. And you're to the good in the first year and next year you're to the good. And, and so, and everybody can see that because they were all, you know, technical people and they were all steeped in total quality management and activity-based costing and a whole bunch of other things. And so that made sense to them and they could go then and sell that. They were, they were suffering sticker shock, but I bet you when they went and sold it to their bosses, bosses, bosses to get the money, they led with the cost of non-conformance and then talked about the cost of conformance. We got a $10 million problem here. We can solve it for two. Who's interested? Everybody. That's great. Guy, thank you so much. That uh, Not only did I learn a lot, I was also entertained. <laughs>
<laughs> you got some great bon mots in there. <laughs> so the I anecdotes. Know. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The training education is a classic one. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Bob Mager. I'll, yeah. yeah. I'll be quoting that for the rest of my life. <laughs> well, and it's funny because I have I've I've mentioned that a few times here in the last decade or so. Because it was, I mean, everybody had heard that, and he might have said it at ASTD back in the day then also, and at Lakewood Conferences, so those the big three back in the 80s and early 90s. But uh, so so there are people, when I've said that, go, oh, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> from some, Yeah, I can see where that line would be the one that, like, stuck in the... Um, it's a, it's a classic. ...institutional memory, so... All right. Well, thank you, Jonathan. Thank you so much. All right, Levi, see you in a few. See you, ma'am. And I'm actually going to jump off too. Well, my question was in relationship to contracting and you kind of, you hit all around the the question mark I had. I just want to say thank you. This has been a phenomenal uh, conversation. I, I, you know, I wouldn't call it a discussion. You just, uh, you shared a whole lot. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take care. Good luck with your project. (laughs) Yep. See ya. Thank you, Guy. You're welcome, Gary.